you're taking time out of your busy schedule to view this presentation on trauma and its impact on children. We believe that the adoption of these core competencies into practice will improve the outcomes for children with behavioral health needs and their families. These foundational modules are developed to be viewed by family members, higher education students, paraprofessionals, and professionals. A list of resources and references have also been provided. This module will be presented by Erin Barnett, Assistant Professor of Psychiatry at the Giselle School of Medicine at Dartmouth. The New Hampshire Children's Behavioral Health Workforce Development Network is to build a sustainable infrastructure for the professional development of the children's behavioral health workforce based upon the core competencies and infused with the system of care core values and guiding principles. The need is for New Hampshire to have an adequate workforce and an infrastructure to support those who work with children, youth, and families. The New Hampshire Children's Behavioral Health Core Competencies were developed in 2011 by a representation of diverse stakeholder groups, including child-serving community mental health providers, family organizations, state policymakers, and university staff. The goal was that the competencies would be the first step in developing systematic and comprehensive human services development infrastructure. The competencies were developed using the system of care core values and principles as the foundation. There are seven domains, family-driven and youth-guided practice, cultural and linguistic competence, childhood development and disorders, screening assessment and referral, treatment planning, interventions and service delivery, systems knowledge and collaboration, and quality improvement. The competencies are organized for professional staff by levels of knowledge and skills in each domain. There are three levels, foundational, intermediary, and advanced. The levels are designed to identify the skill level of practitioners. They are fluid and not specifically tied to certain formal education and training or position titles. A copy of the report can be accessed and a link is provided at the end of this presentation. This is one of a series of modules designed to support the development of core competencies in the children's behavioral health workforce. Erin Barnett will be presenting on trauma and its impact on children. Dr. Barnett is an assistant professor of psychiatry at the Giselle School of Medicine at Dartmouth. Her clinical expertise and research interests are in helping children of all ages and their families recover from trauma. Following this presentation, viewers will be able to answer the following questions. What is trauma? What are symptoms of post-traumatic stress? How does trauma impact children? And how do we help traumatize children? So what do we mean when we say trauma? People use this word differently and sometimes quite casually, so here is the textbook definition. According to the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual Mental Disorder, 5th edition, affectionately called the DSM-5, a traumatic event involves exposure to actual or threatened death or serious injury or sexual violence. So these events can be directly experienced, witnessed, or one can learn of them happening to a close family member or a friend, or they could involve repeat, direct, meaning not through media, exposure to aversive details of horrific events. So for example, first responders who are responding to crisis and accidents. Traumatic events are quite common, so some estimates are that 40% of all children will have experienced a potentially traumatic event by the time they're 18, and nearly all people, over 90%, will experience an event over the course of a lifetime. So the reason I say potentially traumatic event is they're not traumatic for everyone. So what do we mean when we say PTSD, or post-traumatic stress symptoms, in children and adolescents? So when you think of PTSD, think of it as a failure to recover following trauma. So for one reason or another, you don't have the resources needed, resiliency factors like social support, cognitive skills, emotion regulation skills, whatever, to recover within a certain amount of time. Research suggests that that normal amount of time needed to recover from an extreme event is less than a month. So it's normal to have symptoms in the acute aftermath of a scary event. In fact, it's adaptive. That's how we survive as a species if a tiger runs after you in the jungle and you barely escape death. 
It's adaptive and normal to be scared of tigers while in the jungle for a while. The problem is when you're no longer in the jungle, or the war, or the abusive situation, for example, and you continue to have symptoms that interfere with your life, like always looking out for danger, or being on edge, not sleeping, having nightmares. So in DSM-5, there are four clusters of PTSD symptoms. You can see them here. <clears throat> Intrusion, avoidance, negative changes in thoughts and feelings, and arousal or reactivity symptoms. So the classic symptoms of PTSD involve intrusive memories or nightmares of the event, avoidance of trauma memories or things that remind you of the trauma, negative thoughts about oneself or the world and depressed mood, and anxiety, hypervigilance, so looking around for danger, and sleep problems. And there's now a special subtype for children under the age of six. This is for the first time in history. The other important aspect of diagnoses in DSM-5 is that as clinicians, we're supposed to specify whether the, the child has dissociative symptoms present. So we all know that many effects of trauma go way beyond how we classify symptoms in a diagnostic manual. When you look at a traumatized child, you know this. So trauma can have impacts on all aspects of a developing child. Not always, but sometimes. So why is that? Well, the child is in a crucial period of development, a sensitive period, if you will, during which time the brain and the body are responding to cues from the environment. And when those cues are constantly stressful and traumatic, we develop differently than when the environment is, for the most part, nurturing and safe. So this leads to all kinds of disruptions in emotional, social, cognitive, and physical development. Development in these areas are affected by actual changes in brain structures, such as the amygdala, which regulates emotion, and the hippocampus, which is the center for memory, and changes in neurochemistry, like the stress hormones of adrenaline and cortisol, and changes to our built-in fear response systems, like our sympathetic and our parasympathetic nervous systems. So let's talk about how trauma can impact the emotional development of a child. Where does emotional development come from? When you think of it, it derives from a sense of felt safety and security and caregiver attunement. So the picture here shows a mother gazing at her child. Well, that's what we mean by attunement, reacting to the child's facial reactions, reacting to their cues, their needs. So what predicts emotion regulation? We have some studies that show certain types of parenting and caregiver styles that predict good emotion regulation in older children. <clears throat> it all starts with something called caregiver sensitivity. And it's, it's what I was describing before, like attunement. When a mother or a father or the caregiver is tuned in to how the child is feeling, acting, what the child needs, they often re will reflect the child's facial expressions, they will make noises and coo, and this starts right as a, uh, from infancy. So caregiver sensitivity then predicts infant social engagement, so eye contact, responding to touch, and infant's fear responses, say for example when there's a loud noise, and an infant's physiological stress reactions. Those three things then predict um, a toddler or an older child's ability to regulate emotion. So it all starts with uh, an attuned, sensitive caregiver. So our stress response systems in the nervous and the limbic systems, for example, are really affected when a child is repeatedly exposed to stress and trauma. The systems and circuitry that normally bring a child back to baseline following stress can burn out, so to speak, so that we no longer respond to stress effectively. This system deteriorates when overwhelmed by stress, either shutting down or sometimes not allowing us to shut off our alarm system, keeping us constantly vigilant, constantly anxious, constantly revved up, I like to call it. We also have research that shows that the body's stress hormones are negatively altered. So for example, cortisol is known as a stress hormone, and when we get too much of it in our system because of too much stress, it leads to all kinds of bad outcomes like weight gain and heart disease. Perhaps most important on a more practical level, when we're overwhelmed by thoughts or memories or our stress response system is overwhelmed, 
we have fewer resources left over to dedicate to normal growth and development in areas like emotion regulation, socializing with peers, and learning. It's really hard to expect a child who is, for example, preoccupied with fear or wondering whether everyone at home is safe to sit still in class, pay attention, and take advantage of normal opportunities that most children have to learn social skills with peers, like on the playground. What we expect from others. Will they be kind? Will they meet my needs? Will they hurt me? And what we expect from the world. Is the world safe? Is it predictable? Those are born out of what we get from our caregivers and our early environment. Traumatized children sometimes expect others to hurt them or not care about their needs or to be unpredictable and may expect the world to be unsafe. So they may act in ways that even if the environment or their caretakers or their peers are safe, they may act in ways that make these expectations come true. This explains why some children act out or act inappropriately in relationships. They are, in essence, recreating the types of relationships they are familiar with. They may not trust or get close to anyone. They might not explore their worlds, all leading again to deficits in social development. We need those experiences with others to learn social skills, to learn to manage the emotions that come with meeting all kinds of kinds. The other layer involves the modeling they receive from caregivers and others in their lives. This is how we learn how to treat others and how one should be treated. You can imagine that a sexual abuse victim, for example, may have ideas, perhaps even unconscious, about how they or their bodies are to be treated, that is, to be used to meet another, more powerful person's needs, for example. So let's talk a little bit more about social development. Because children who experience trauma cannot take advantage of social interactions in the same way as other children, they often lack these social skills and they look immature. And they may be socially anxious, which keeps them from interacting with other kids. They may have problems trusting others, and they often don't have a healthy sense of boundaries. So, and on top of that, if the child has trouble with emotion regulation and, say, throws tantrums, it creates a cycle of peers and even adults not wanting to interact with them, which, again, can lead to isolation and fewer opportunities than normal children have to learn from all these social interactions. When under threat or fear, we cannot access our brain's higher level areas. So what does that mean? Well, in those moments of fear or anxiety or even anger and rage, the brain dedicates all of its efforts towards survival. So those are areas of the brain that are low in the more primitive regions called the brainstem and the diencephalon. This prepares the body to fight, flee, or freeze. The brain shuts down the unneeded higher level areas such as the frontal lobe and the prefrontal cortex. Of course, of course, those areas are the places that help us think. That is, slow down, think through what is happening, plan, problem solve. One important point to take home from this slide is that talking to a child or processing with them what is happening usually fails in the moments when they're really revved up and feeling out of control. Rather, they need to feel safe, secure, and they need ways to physiologically calm their bodies. Because when constantly under stress, the higher level brain functions are subject to the use it or lose it model. So if children aren't using those higher functioning areas, also sometimes thought of as a learning center, their cognitive skills do not develop on track, and this can mean learning problems down the road. Particularly in sexual and physical abuse, we might see children who seem very dissociated or disconnected from their bodies. They have learned to shut off pain, in a sense, and therefore also shut off all physical sensations, including the good. So I've seen sexual abuse victims who just seem phobic of their own bodies. Obviously, we can imagine the impact that sexual abuse in particular has on sexual development. That doesn't take a rocket scientist. Further, we now know that human contact, love, affection is needed to release the growth hormone. In the most extreme cases, children literally do not grow without physical affection, and this is called failure to thrive. 
So thanks to other research coming out of the ACE study, the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, we know that traumatic events in childhood increase the likelihood of not only mental health and substance abuse problems in adulthood, which is no surprise, but also physical problems such as cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and cancer. So it's clear that the impact of trauma can be huge, and this begs the questions of what to do about it. So first, ideally, would be prevention. So what kind of legal changes could be made in our society? Lobbying for change, legislative changes, informing judges and advocacy groups about child abuse and its impact, how to stop it. And social changes, so giving a voice to babies and to children who can't speak for themselves. A social intolerance of violence against women and children. And teaching and modeling safe and respectful social behaviors to our children. So when a child is traumatized, we really want to first create safety. So an actual sense of safety and a felt sense of safety, talking about how the child can feel safe, talking about what the child can do when they feel unsafe. We want to get a child back on a normal developmental track. We want to reduce PTSD symptoms if those occur. And we want to build resiliency, particularly social support. I love this quote from Bruce Perry. In the old days, so to speak, we used to think that children are resilient and they can bounce back from everything. And we have since, in the last few decades, um, you know, realized that this isn't, this isn't always true. And he has a quote that resilient children are made, not born. So more specifically, in the acute aftermath of trauma, so less than a month in those first few weeks, what can we do to create safety? Not only removing the child from the danger or the danger from the child, which is the better outcome, we talk to the child, if they're verbal, about who's on their safety team, who all is looking out for them, and a lot of discussions around what would you do if blank? What would mom do if blank? So giving them ideas, a visual picture they can imagine, what would do if they were feeling unsafe if a person or something who scared them came near them. We want to build social and community supports and we want to allow for discussion of the trauma if the child desires. Most research at this point suggests not to push things too quickly um, in the few weeks after or immediate aftermath of a trauma but of course being there to validate and discuss the, the events if the child wants to. So how do we help other traumatized children in the longer term when a child is not naturally recovered on their own? So again, most people and most children naturally recover, but if we don't have the supports and other resiliency factors, we're less likely to recover. And that's when it's time to think about um, an intervention. So we have certain evidence-based interventions for traumatized children that actually work really well. And here are some principles of those interventions. We want to build coping skills, affect emotion coping skills, cognitive coping skills, parental caregiver support skills. A lot of traumatized children can't be expected to quote, cope on their own. They often need a lot of help and co-regulation from caregivers. Interventions for trauma, we want to include caregivers or support person if at all possible not only just to bear witness and validate um, what the child has been through, but to provide support and coaching. And also, uh, we can train them in parent management strategies. So when the child is really anxious, when the child is really angry, specific concrete things a parent can do to help them. And evidence-based interventions are trauma-focused. So what does that mean? that there is some discussion of the events or at least the impact on the child. You don't just avoid the issue and never talk about it. You talk about it right away. You validate that something's happened and it's scary and it's hard. And depending on the model, you go into more or less detail about the traumatic event. So in New Hampshire, we have uh, a couple interventions that are evidence-based for traumatized children. We have trauma-focused Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, also known as TFCBT, and this is probably the most well-researched, most effective treatment we've seen, and it's for ages 4 to 18. 
We also have a model called Child Parent Psychotherapy, or CPP, and this is for the really young ones, for the babies and the toddlers. And of course, this one is even more important to have caregivers, and it's actually a dyadic treatment, so you don't see the child alone. It's all about strengthening the relationship to help the child heal. There are other evidence-based or evidence-informed interventions. Those might include other attachment models or treatments targeting emotional dysregulation or treatments targeting environmental instability and building up those supports. So things like dialectical behavioral therapy or multisystemic therapy. So thank you for listening and thanks for all that you do for traumatized children.